So welcome back. Um, this is going to be our first pre-lecture video for the next lecture on Wednesday. Um, this pre-lecture video, like most of them, will be broken up into a few smaller videos. Um, we'll start in this video kind of finishing off where we left off on Monday, kind of talking about this one last step in our general ML pipeline called feature extraction. So as a bit of recap, we've been introducing the concept of the linear regression model. So we talked about how with the ML model, we're assuming this linear relationship between the input and the output. And we also talked about the quality metric. Uh, so when regression. Fine. Um, and then for the quality metric, we talked about the residual sum of squares. So talking about a particular line, trying to identify if this line is good or not, we use the residual sum of squares, which is the sum of the squared errors. And if that's a large uh, value, that means it uh, has lots of error. If it's a small value, it means it has a little error. And then we talked about our ML algorithm that lets us find the line that minimizes error, where we use gradient descent. That's kind of what we've covered so far in terms of this ML pipeline and think about linear regression. Now, what I want us to start off with in this video is talking about feature extraction. So talking about features we can use in our predictor to make it potentially better. So what if I wanted to learn a predictor that wasn't just a line? Like if I look at this data, I see that there's kind of a curve to it. And so what if I wanted to fit a higher degree polynomial like this. Remember I said, what if the true function looks like that? But what if I wanted to learn a function that looks like potentially what the true function would look like? So what if I want a higher degree polynomial? Well, it turns out that it's not actually that difficult to do. We just have to use a slightly different machine learning model. Instead of assuming that the world follows a linear relationship, you could assume it follows some polynomial relationship where Instead of just having an intercept and slope, you have a coefficient for each power of your input. So you have w0 for the intercept, w1 for the coefficient for just xi, and w2 for the coefficient of xi squared, plus w3, uh, w3 being the coefficient for xi cubed. And it's a lot of the same stuff as before. Our goal now is just to find a good setting of these coefficients to find a polynomial that matches. But now we're allowing a little bit more complexity in here because now you can account for quadratic or cubic behavior. So one way of describing this is thinking about what we call higher order features, including extra values in your model that contain more complexity, like xi squared or xi cubed. And so what we'll call this particular type of regression, we call this polynomial regression where we have a polynomial of degree p as our model. So instead of linear regression being our, our model, we have polynomial regression, which tells us kind of how we think the world behaves, or we assume this is how the world behaves. And so here we're gonna pick some degree p that we believe that the world follows a degree p polynomial. So xi, xi, oh, that should be a squared. I'll fix that on the sides. xi cubed, xi all the way to the p. And it's actually very similar in spirit to linear regression. But in what it's going to be using is something with, uh, we'll say it has more features. That it's using more values in its computation, where simple linear regression just used one, a square footage in our housing price example. So it turns out that this idea of polynomial regression, trying to fit a polynomial, is actually just a special case of linear regression. That sounds kind of confusing because polynomials sound a lot more general, a lot more flexible than linear functions. The way we'd think about this is that it's just linear regression, but using more features. And those features happen to be polynomially related to our single input that we had before, the square footage. So now we have one feature for um, this, the square foot, one feature for the square foot squared, one foot for the square foot cubed, and so on and so on to the power of p. We're just training a linear model 
in a feature space using features that it's able to use in its computation that are more complex. <clears throat> if you think of polynomial regression in that lens, that it's just linear regression but using extra features, then everything we've talked about before matches here. We could still use our quality metric, that's the residual sum of squares, and we could still use gradient descent to find the right coefficients. But now instead of just having two parameters we have to optimize, we have uh, p plus one parameters. We have p parameters here for all of the kind of these coefficients, plus one for the intercept. There's p plus one total uh, parameters we have to learn. But besides that, all of the ideas of linear regression apply here. We just sometimes call this a special case of polynomial regression. So one thing you might be interested in, in asking, is how do you choose in polynomial regression or linear regression with polynomial features? That's the same thing. How do you know what degree P do you want to use? Do you want to use a zero degree polynomial? In which case, this would just be a constant value. Would you want to use a one degree polynomial? Which with a, one, a deg polynomial degree one is just a line, just linear regression. Would you want to use a two degree polynomial? One that maybe has some quadratic curve to it. Would you want to use a three degree polynomial? Maybe that has some, some more bends to it. Or heck, why don't why stop at three? Why not go all the way up to something like 32 and learn some really wild polynomial like this? How do you choose the right polynomial power P? That is going to be the focus of today's lesson. We'll talk about how do you compare models from different, uh, how do you compare predictors from different models? A degree zero polynomial versus degree 32. That's going to be the focus and what we'll talk a little bit, a little bit about in the next pre-lecture video for today. But we're going to ignore that question for now. We're just going to assume that we're happy. We know somehow how to choose P, even though we'll talk about how to do that later. But I want to actually generalize this notion of polynomial regression. So it turns out there's nothing special about polynomials. This notion, I've been using this word a couple of times, feature, is a very useful concept of just some arbitrary transformation on your data. So we talk about features being the values we select or compute from the data we received that we're going to use in our model. And so we call the step of feature extraction of actually deriving features or selecting features from the data given. Now, how do you want to define these features? It's very abstract. It's very generic. This is supposed to work in almost any context. So we describe a feature extraction step as being this function h. h0 it extracts the first feature. h1 extracts the second. h2 extracts the third. All the way up to h capital D. So we, we choose capital B, D to be how many features we want. And we use this as a very, very generic way of trying to work with almost any regression task. So for example, oh, whoops, I didn't mean to go forward. So for example, you might want h1 of x to just be xi. Maybe you want h2 of x to be xi squared. Maybe you want the next one to be xi cubed uh, times log of xi. Maybe you want this to be e to the xi whatever you want. You get to define how you want to transform your input into features and use them in the model. Almost all of actually the really hard work in machine learning practice is coming up with a good set of features to represent your data. Because if you can find features that represent your data well, then the machine learning task is easy. It's just a linear regression. But trying to figure out which features to use is quite hard. And that's usually where a lot of domain expertise comes in that you know for some reason that the log of the square footage is more useful than just the raw square footage. I'm not sure if that's actually true, but it could be true. So you could derive kind of what set of features you think are the most useful for this task. And then our general regression model is just linear regression, but on these capital D, well, D plus one, um, features. Where we extract these kind of D plus one values, and then we weight them by some parameter wj. So we have 
all of these parameters to learn. It's kind of like polynomial regression, but not necessarily polynomials. It could be any arbitrary function, as long as you come up with these feature maps. So we often call these um, H, uh, HJ functions uh, feature maps, feature extractions, that take an input and tell you a feature value for it. Um, and commonly, it's com often goes unsaid, we usually think about uh, a dummy feature map, H0, just often mapping to the number one so that you can have a coefficient. Then you can kind of represent your, regr oops, your regression quite nicely as just this kind of sum from J equals zero to capital D, where the, when J is equal to zero, we just have this constant number one, which lets us be our intercept. So that's just a very succinct way of, of talking about this. So this is the most generic regression model you can come up with. Is not linear, it's not necessarily polynomial, it's any sum of these transformations of your inputs. Okay. Now, one other thing I want to add, and one extra complexity I want to add here, is usually in your data set, you don't just have one number like square footage. You normally have a table that has lots of columns. So maybe each row corresponds to a house, and each column corresponds to some dimension of that house, like its square footage, or the number of bathrooms, or the owner's age. And then usually this data table comes with what's the true value, the one that we measured, namely the price. So generally we're given this data table, and all of the columns except the label are our data inputs. They're things that we can potentially use in our machine learning model, and we get to choose which ones we want. But importantly, this data input or this data table are things just given to us or we downloaded or we collected, but we just got those. And importantly, the reason we want to think about this is it lets us come up with more complex models that we can make a feature for each data input. So maybe if I'm just restricting myself to two data inputs, square footage and number of bathrooms, you can make a more complex uh, machine learning model by saying it's some w1 times the square footage plus w2 times the number of bathrooms. And then we usually have an intercept term w0. Just like with linear regression, we're treating this like linear combination of values, but now we're using multiple data inputs, getting this more complex relationship, saying maybe I can model price with both the square footage and the number of bathrooms. And maybe I can identify how those work together they answer what's the price should be. And there's nothing necessarily restricting you to just two of these inputs as features. You can use as many or as few of them as you want, just depending on what your modeling task is. We'll talk a little bit about in today's lesson how we choose what's the right set of features. Now, one useful thing about this kind of uh, more inputs model where you're using more than one input is that you can still interpret the coefficients of the model. But the coefficients of this kind of uh, case we're using inputs as features, the coefficient for number of bathrooms, W2, tells you the rate of change in the output or the unit change in the input, assuming all other features are constant. So W2, in this case, where it's W2 is in front of the number of bathrooms, tells you if you hold all other features of the house constant, but vary number of bathrooms by one, it will go up or down by W2. And this is actually a really useful interpretive task, where if you train a model on a bunch of different features, you can try to interpret the coefficients to see which ones have the most outsized effect. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that next week, how we can interpret these coefficients a little bit more. But here, we started with just simple linear regression, and we talked about using feature extractions to get polynomial regression or just more general regression. And then now I'm talking about using more than one input to your thing, but it's just using them as separate features. So everything about different features stays the same. But it's important that we distinguish between data inputs and features. Because data inputs are things provided to us, they're values of the data. While features are choices we make of and possibly transformed values from the data we got. And that's an explicit modeling task we have to do, choosing which features. And very commonly, a very good default is just use all the inputs you have available as features, and then try something more complex if that doesn't work. Maybe try to reduce the number of features, 
but this is a modeling task. So features are part of the model, while data inputs are part of the provided data. And I want to mention just in terms of notation, we usually use X to represent the raw data input. And so we'll usually think about this data input as being a d-dimensional vector, a little d, where there's kind of a first thing, a second thing, a third thing, all the way to uh, a little d. So however many columns your data has minus the label. Then we usually think about the output being labeled yi. So xi is the ith row. Xij is the ith row's jth data input or jth column. And then hj of xi is the jth feature we extract from the ith row. So it might be number of bathrooms squared plus uh, the number of or the square footage. Whatever transformation you decide. But you can imagine it would have many possible feature extractions, and it can combine multiple features, or sorry, multiple inputs from the data table. Okay. So you can use anything you want as features, including as many or as few of them as you want. Generally, the more features you include, the more complex your model is going to be. And this might not always be a good thing, as we'll see later in this lesson. And choosing good features is a bit of an art. Trying to figure out kind of and, and a bit of trial and error. Trying this set of features, maybe changing it in this way. But you, just for example, can make H your first feature, the number of square feet, the second feature, the number of bathrooms, and then the Dth feature, the log of the seventh data input times the second. I just, again, completely arbitrary. This is a choice you make as a modeler what features you want. Okay. And then we're kind of nearing the end of everything I wanted to cover on the first day which is we now have talked about feature extraction, and now we can look at a glance at the linear regression model and this whole ML pipeline. We have a data set, which is a series of N, X, I, Y, I pairs. And more generally, kind of before I just told you we had square footage, now we use this notation to say X is a vector that is composed of little d numbers. So you have number of number of bathrooms, square footage, owner's age, et cetera, et cetera, whatever came in your data table, that has dimensionality little d. And the output we're working with y is going to be a number, a real number. So this notation is saying y is a real number. Then our feature extraction step is using um, a mapping from this data input in dimensionality little d and changing it to a vector in dimensionality big D. And you can imagine this new kind of transformed input being a vector where each entry is the feature extracted for that dimension. So if we have capital D um, uh, features that we want to work with, and commonly we also include that coefficient one that's just the dummy, it just includes one. But we use this as kind of a way of talking about kind of what features we're interested in. And again, very commonly, it makes entire sense to just start with using the data inputs as your feature. So sometimes using like identity map, just mapping the inputs to itself. That's okay. But you can be more complex than that. You can do any arbitrary transformation that you want. We then talked about the regression model, which is this kind of idea that the y's are equal to this kind of function, this unknown f applied to the input plus some epsilon. And we said that we're going to weight this and kind of this most common regression case is this weighted sum where each term has a coefficient, wj. So we have all of these coefficients we have to learn, but we assume are there, plus some still have some noise in our model. And I wanted to quickly mention that you'll commonly see this if you ever look up in sources online. There's a lot of vector or matrix notation for these things. This is a very useful one that comes up a lot. It's this notion of a dot product or an inner product. When I say W transpose or WTHX, that's W transpose, which if you haven't taken linear algebra, that's totally fine. Just know that this notation is shorthand for this sum. Sum from J equals zero to capital D, WJ, HJ of X. It's multiplying all of the W components with all their respective H components and then summing all of those up to shorthand. You'll see that quite frequently, so I wanted to make sure you've seen that at least once. Okay, almost there. We then talked about the quality metric being the residual sum of squares. 
So it's the true value minus the predicted value. We square that and sum it up. And again, see, I'm using that shorthand notation because it's convenient. W transpose XI is kind of what our, our transformation here. And then our predictor, the thing that we're going to predict, is the thing that minimizes the residual sum of squares. We're going to search over all Ws, find the one that minimizes the minimum sum of squares, and then set output that as our W hat. And our ML algorithm to find that minimum usually is gradient descent. But there's other algorithms, other techniques, but we just talked about that. And that, my friends, is the one slide version of everything we introduced today. Oh, and also the prediction being just whatever you found from your W hat, multiplying by all those future values. And that is everything we learned today or in, in Monday's class. And now we'll pick up in today's lesson talking about some really important points, like how do you know if the right set of features is the right one? What's the right complexity of the model you want to use? But we'll talk about that next.